Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to Vernon Trafford. Vernon has a wealth of experience in supervising and examining PhDs and now has a particular interest in exploring the issue of doctorateness. So in today's episode, we talk about what examiners want to read in a, in a PhD thesis. We talk about also ex- preparing for the viva how to put yourself in a good place with that, and the importance of smiling. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Vernon. Hello Emma, nice to meet you. It is super lovely to meet you. I was just saying this this is the best thing about doing this podcast is I'm getting to meet such amazing, interesting, eloquent people and I am loving it. So thank you for saying yes. Um, I, I reached out because I saw the work that you were doing with um, PhD students, particularly around preparing them for Vivers, and I was just like, "This is amazing!" And I would love to hear you talk more about that. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful that you were uh, willing to come and talk to me. So we're going to kind of get into that in a minute, and this idea of doctorateness. Um, but first of all, I always ask people about their own journeys. So your journey through graduate study and then into your career. So would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Okay, many thanks. Well, let let me start off with a negative. I failed all my A-levels, and that was not a good uh, prelude to a career. Mm. But I went into local government. In local government, I was able to do a diploma in public administration part-time. And from there, I went on full-time. I gave up my job and did a bachelor's degree at Liverpool University in political science. That led me then into what I really wanted to do, which was to teach in higher education. Mm. And I was doing that in Sheffield at the uh, College of Technology. So that was where I was. And I moved from there to Bristol and It was quite interesting because I then started working overseas as an education consultant. And someone realized that what I was doing was more than useful and encouraged me to register the topic that I was working on for the British Council. And that was the basis for my doctorate. So sometime after getting my bachelor's degree, I got my PhD. And that was from the University of Southampton. Uh, After I'd got my doctorate, it was a couple of years before I was then invited uh, by a colleague to be an external examiner at the University of Nottingham. And of course, that was an interesting experience because I saw the Viva then from a different experience, a different Mm. perspective. Mm. Mm. That was being an examiner of it rather than being the recipient of it. And from then on, I took an interest in the uh, the doctoral process. Yes, I think we were just talking about it a little bit before when we uh, we started recording and about being a supervisor and being an examiner and how that gives you a different perspective on it. And yes. um, we were talking about it. certainly sitting the other side of the table has certainly given me a very different perspective. And yes. you have examined many many PhDs now and and we were talking about what yeah what that means the perspective that it gives you um and you're gonna I know you're gonna share some wisdom um in a a minute about that and I'm really interested too it's so interesting hearing people's journeys through and that sense of um uh, coming into your process coming through um work and then coming um Right, working on your doctorate as a result of your work experience um, and 
I, I think it's it's really interesting. And I, I was sharing with you too that kind of my A level teacher told me that I wasn't an academic, <laughs> which I took as a challenge. But I think that I think that um, there are people come into PhD study with a lot of um, perhaps self doubt and worry about their own um, ability. But actually, you're, you're kind of you're coming through and you're you're um, you're proving yourself as you're doing this process. So uh, it's great to hear that. Um, the, the journey that you've taken you have yeah done so much and now have, have, have really um skilled experienced and able to offer support to PhD students who are coming through now and um, and you sent me some information in advance and one of the brilliant questions which I said yes please answer this is what do examiners really expect to read in a doctoral thesis and it's like yes I think people might be interested to know the answer to that Vernon okay. <laughs> so, so can you tell us the answer to that um uh yeah well I'll, I'll do my best but let me put a, a really naughty thing right up front and I know that other examiners have experienced this also. And that is when you turn up for a viva, either as an internal or an external examiner, and you find that the other person literally either did not understand the thesis which they're now examining purportedly, or hadn't read it and didn't understand it. And that's happened to me, I think, three times. Blimey. And I just find that insulting to yeah. everyone. Yeah. It's insulting to the candidate. It's insulting to the other examiner. And as far as uh, the academic system is concerned, it's basically saying, I don't want to do this. Yeah. However, that's only three. And I've now uh, examined or been at uh, Vivas 116 times. Hmm. And the majority of people, without question, are helpful, positive, they are constructive. And what they do is turn up to the viva, expecting the candidate to be able to defend what they have produced. Hmm. And hmm. I'll say that again, expecting candidates to defend what they've produced. So they go in there with a positive frame of mind. And that is really very encouraging. And what are they looking at? Well, they're looking at both the content of the doctoral thesis, what's on the page, and they're looking at the process whereby the candidate must have worked, read, thought about, responded to supervisors' comments in order to provide text explicitly and well presented. So the majority of supervisors they're not on the side of the candidate because that's a silly thing to say, but they're more than sympathetic towards the candidate right from the start. Yes. So what are they looking for in the thesis? Well, that's a difficult thing to, to answer, believe it or not. Yes. <laughs> because they will be looking for different things and that will depend on their own particular interests. And let me indicate four of these. They may be looking at philosophical underpinnings of the entire piece of work. And the reason for that is they're philosophically inclined in, in their uh, academic work and approach. Next, they may be looking at evidence of scholarship. So is this based on broad reading, which has been clearly understood and used to design the research and to analyze the findings? Or are they looking at it from the point of view of the candidate who will be a postdoctoral capability as a supervisor oblique researcher mm. if they pass their, their viva? Mm. And lastly, they're looking at maturity of understanding by candidates of what they've done. Mm. So they don't want to hear from the candidate a, re a repetition of what they've done in a descriptive way. They want mm. to see some understanding there. Mm. So those are four different ways as stances in which a supervisor may 
approach the entire task. And I'm not saying these are independent of each other because as you can see, they are interdependent. So uh, there may be emphasis on one of those four features. And I've certainly worked with uh, colleague examiners who have emphasized one or more of, of those perspectives. Mm. So I think it's, it's a very useful question, but not an easy one to answer. Because if you said, well, it is that, they're looking for evidence of scholarship, someone else is entitled to say, well, what about philosophical underpinnings or independence in the future or maturity of the candidate or something else? Yes, I think I think so much useful stuff in there. Totally an unfair question in terms of what are people looking for. So thank you for answering it. <laughs> but yes, that sense of um, I think what's really useful is knowing that people are going to be like, hopefully and usually bringing their best selves to this. The examiners are coming because they want to examine this topic. I say I personally don't accept um the invitations to be an examiner unless I am genuinely interested in the work I feel that I have something to speak about with in terms of in relation to the work I still feel like I have some kind of um, reference points for the work yes. so this sense of looking forward to having a discussion around this area so they come in a genu genuinely we hope open-hearted ready to discuss um perspective and I think Absolutely. that that's really useful to remember because I think people often project onto their examiners this kind of this this um that they're going to be trying to trip them up and trying to um make life difficult for them that that actually is not the way that you know they're human beings <laughs> they're coming to be helpful um it's a service that people do they don't have to do this as part of their job they do it as, as a kind of service and but, I th could I just follow on from yes that, please you know? do I think there is um, a great shame in that people learn about the Viva before they've had one yes. from other people, many of whom have not been to a Viva, or worse than that, have told of the, uh, the awkward and embarrassing and difficult and unpleasant sides of a Viva. Yeah. So Vivas have an unfortunate reputation, and I think yeah. an undeserved reputation. Yes. Certainly from my experience and the experience of many of my colleagues uh, who do not recognize the criticisms that people level at the Viva process. And sure, there are Vivas which are um, unpleasant and unfortunate occasions, certainly for the candidate, but they are few and far between. Yeah. But regrettably, that is what others then talk about. Yeah. Yes, Does that absolutely. Make sense? it makes absolute sense. And I think that um, it, it is really, really important to me. And especially things are changing now. So in terms of having um, independent chairs, that's the usual practice now. So you know that you'll have somebody who's making sure that it is a fair and um, clear process. But I think also someone else talked in the another podcast episode about choosing your examiners carefully and I think again it, coming back to what you were saying in terms of the way in which um, examiners are approaching the subject knowing if someone has a kind of a philosophical bent you because you know their work because you would have read their work you will understand who you are inviting to examine your project and you can have an, an understanding of where they're going to be coming from and have a sense of what sort of person they are hopefully you've you know met them at a conference or you've had a sense of them so that you you know who you're entering into discussion with yes um but you, absolutely i think it's like those awful before you go and do your university interviews everybody tells you these awful experiences that they've had in interview and some of them might be made up um but this, this sense of yeah that 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 you're going to hear Viva horror stories, that doesn't mean that your Viva is going to be a horror story and you can do things to um, try and make sure that your Viva is the best experience that it can be yes. for you. No, I, I agree entirely. And I think you're, you're right. The frequency now in which um, I hear people talking about the good chair of my Viva yeah. or something like that yeah um our legion 
And I think that's excellent because the, the chair has the role, the formal role, to ensure equity in the process, uh, to ensure compliance with the regulations of the university, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it doesn't mean that didn't happen previously, but now there is someone whose responsibility it is to ensure that it happens. And exactly. there's a difference between those two. And that makes a great difference. And it can only be for the benefit of the candidate, the supervisors who are present, and the examiners themselves. Absolutely. You know, because as a chair, as you all know, you have that list. You have a list, you have a checklist, mm. and you stick to that. Um, and so everybody is clear on, on how they're going forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was introduced, certainly in, in Britain. There was sort of understanding of it. There wasn't any great objection to it, but all universities didn't uh, adopt it at the same time by any means. It took a little while to move around. I, I don't know the dates or the times for, for all of that, but I do recall um, examining people when there was no chair, and there was no chair at, at, at my viva, and that, that was in the, uh, in the 80s. But now... It would be very, very unusual, I think, I'm not sure, but I think very unusual in Britain for there to be a viva without a chair. Mm. And that's only for the, the benefit of everyone. Mm. Mm. Definitely, definitely. Um, so I've asked you one unfair question in terms of what people, what examiners expect to read. And now I'm going to ask you another unfair question in terms of can you offer a top tip or some top tips for people who are getting ready to uh, submit and to have their viva? Well, I suppose I can and should be able to do so, but I wouldn't offer a top tip because I don't think there is one. No, uh, that's, uh, what, that's what I say. It's a, it's a ridiculous question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but there are a number of, of different things for different reasons. And I think the first is to recognize before you submit, if we're talking about the candidate, before you submit that your thesis displays a number of features. Because if it does, then you're more likely to pass than if it doesn't. Mm. And these are the obvious things. And I'm going to list them because that's the only way to do it. And there's a dozen or more of them. Your thesis has got to start off with a gap in knowledge, and it's got to be stated, not assumed. It's got to have explicit research questions, not just aims and objectives and goals and purposes, which are often impossible to, to meet or to measure. It's got to have a conceptual framework, i.e. the link between the reading that you've done to produce uh, philosophical and uh, yeah, philosophical perspectives and the practice of designing the research. It's got to state explicitly what and why the research has been designed in a particular way, whether it's inductive or in or uh, deductive or mixed methods. And that's got to then produce the appropriate methodology because if it isn't appropriate to what you want to look at, then it's just inappropriate. The method of data collection has got to be justified and explained. So instead of reading, and I used this form of collecting data, you've got to explain it. Why did you do that? So the word why comes before each of these categories. Having collected the data, it's got to be analyzed correctly and appropriately. And this is a technical process, whether you're using inductive or deductive methods of uh, research, it's got to be appropriate to that. And then the whole process has to engage with theory. It was Kurt Lewin who said, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. Mm. And the moment I heard someone say that in a presentation, I, like everyone else in the room, just stopped because that was just so powerful. Mm. There is mm. nothing so practical as good theory. I mean, there are two utterly different notions 
associated together in one sentence that really has meaning. Mm. Then you've got to have a cogent argument throughout the thesis. Now, don't laugh too loudly, but research questions have to be answered. Mm. And occasionally candidates don't answer, don't answer their own questions, mm. which raises in my mind, how did that get past the supervisor? there have to be conceptual conclusions because the doctorate is working at the higher level of thinking, higher order of thinking, and the conclusions must relate back to the literature and the uh, conceptual principles and issues which have been raised earlier. And finally, the whole thing must make a contribution to knowledge. Now, sorry to have gone on, but all of those are interdependent. And what that means is that the candidate must have developed the capacity and ability to think interconnectedly between the parts of their thesis in order to demonstrate higher level thinking. Because that's what a doctorate is. It's not describing something, though there will be description inevitably within the thesis but it's demonstrating higher order thinking, which means higher level thinking about a topic which has been investigated. And those features I just listed are the ways by which that should be done. And examiners would be looking for those. Well, blimey, I've, I, that's brilliant because that's incredibly clear in terms of that, that list it's like a check, that checklist in terms of what um, to work towards. Yes. And we certainly got value for money there in terms of a top tip. Blimey, thank you. <laughs> so they're, um, they're all together. That's why I, I can't easily give a top tip. I've no. got a couple of other things to, to add at the end. Amazing. But um, doing research isn't just about finding out something. It's about all those other things because they're concerned with the, the process of doing research mm. as well as the act of doing it and the technology of doing it. And there are books which make that extremely clear. And there are other books that don't. But the ones that make it clear are, are the books that really help people produce a better, in inverted commas, uh, doctoral thesis. Mm, mm, this sense of process, yeah, it's so yeah. important, so important. Um, Vernon, thank you so much. We've covered so much <laughs> in this time and I am so grateful to you for coming and, and sharing your experience and sharing your wisdom. Um, as always, we will have... Um, links and more information in the show notes and if you if you want extra um support then if you sign up for the newsletter there will be more information there too okay. in terms of attending to this notion of 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 doctorateness um oh. vernon thank you so much for your time today could could i add one last thing emma oh i love this you're like the perfect guest keep <laughs> on giving i love it yes please do <laughs> well it's this, and this is really addressing the candidate. The Viva is your opportunity to explain to your examiners what your research was all about and why your research has made a contribution to knowledge. And you'll note it that yes. I've used the word your more than once. Yes. So yes. in the Viva, smile. Smile with your examiners. Don't smile at them, but smile with them. Mm. Because if you're doing that, you're demonstrating confidence in what you've done, enjoyment and pleasure in what you've done. And if you're smiling, they can't criticize you in quite the same way as they might do otherwise. I so there's that. always, there's, there's something really positive about uh, the smile. And lastly, recognize that doing research is a process of looking at and displaying the interconnectedness of parts, the sorts of ideas which von Burton Lanfey talks about in open systems theory, where everything is interconnected. And when things are connected, 
then synergy, synergy appears. So in that list that I read through, when they're all present and evident in a thesis, an examiner will recognize that through the quality that comes out, not in any one of those areas, but as a result of all 12 of them being present. Mm. And synergy is really what one has to, uh, to aim at and display within the text. So that means spending time producing text, which is a pleasure to read, which contains all of those things, which is explicit in terms of ideas and issues and concepts. And when all of that happens, it's actually a more enjoyable process of writing. So producing a successful doctoral thesis should be a pleasurable activity. If it isn't, then work a little bit with your supervisor to convert it into something which is pleasurable. Because if it is, then you've increased your enjoyment and your examiner's enjoyment. And therefore you've increased the likelihood that the viva is going to be a pleasurable experience for everyone. I love that. Always good to end, end with pleasurable experiences. Absolutely. I love that. And why Thank shouldn't it be? Why exactly. It be? No, exactly. It should be, ideally, a celebratory, enjoyable experience. Yes. Um, and um, I love smiling and psychological warfare. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Vernon. Um, and thank you all for listening. Thank you.